Hey everybody, it's Derek Martin from CodeOpinion.com and I've been developing a product for the last 10 years. I designed the architecture from scratch since day one and evolved it over time. I made some good architectural decisions and some bad ones. And here are things I learned along the way. The first I'll start with is industry trends on the good side and the bad side of decision making. I'm showing Hacker News here. Whatever you're using to kind of stay up on industry trends, it doesn't have to be to the minute, but you can kind of see where things ultimately go. 10 years ago, there were two kind of industry trends. One was kind of single page applications, and at that time, AngularJS, and the other was microservices. So one regrettable decision is using a SPA, a single page application in AngularJS. Not necessarily either of them specifically, but more the monolithic nature of it. And the reason is, is because it limited options to evolve, which is really a lot you'll see here, is being giving yourself options to evolve the architecture and decision making over time as things change. And creating a SPA specifically monolithic in nature really kind of deterred from that. You're creating all these components in AngularJS, and how else do you use them? Use them. You use them in AngularJS. There really wasn't any way that you could change dependencies. You're kind of really bound to that framework. And if you're building your entire system on that, your entire system is based on it. So let me switch gears here on a good decision I made by not following an industry trend, which will kind of make this Angular spa monolith in nature a little bit more clear, is that I did not use microservices. I'd like to thank Curd for sponsoring this video. Curd is an event native data platform that feeds real time business critical data with historical context and fine grained streams from origination to destination, enhancing data analytics and AI outcomes. For more on Curd, check out the link in the description. So the back end wasn't microservices, it was also a monolith. So a monolith on the front end, monolithic architecture on the back end, but there's a big difference. Is that on the back end, I was very established on creating boundaries around capabilities of what did the system actually do? What did it provide in grouping those capabilities? So I was very clear about defining what the business capabilities are and the boundaries, defining boundaries around that. What that enables you to do is, as I mentioned earlier, give you options to evolve. So each different boundary can define how it implements those particular features, those capabilities, what the dependencies are, different tooling that you're using potentially. I'm showing it this way where maybe I have one boundary where it's very simple. It just sort of has some data model. We interact with the database. That's the end of it. Maybe there's something more where we have more separation because we actually have a rich domain model. We're capturing all the variance business rules. That's how we're managing that. We have an HTTP API in front of it. Maybe there's another part of our system that's really kind of its supporting role. It's not really complicated at all. There's almost no business rules. It's really just kind of creating an API on top of your database. Just let that be that. The point of this is it allows you to be pragmatic. I often get comments or on my Discord about, as an example with domain-driven design, it's like, well, how do I do domain-driven design? And people just want to apply it everywhere. Or how do I want, I want to do event sourcing and I want to do it everywhere. Or I'm using clean architecture and I'm doing it everywhere. It's not all tooling, concepts, different ways that you want to do things need to be applied everywhere. They're, they're solutions for a problem. And if you don't have that problem, you're just adding unneeded complexity, a lot of overhead for just where you don't need it. Defining boundaries allows you to kind of really focus in on it and decide, okay, what do I actually need to do here given that context? What's appropriate? So jumping back to a spa in a monolithic front end with AngularJS will be better served is instead of being so granular at the component level, is really thinking about what's often more important is the actual action, the page itself, and grouping and having that be a, a boundary in itself, or maybe a grouping of particular pages be boundaries and define the technology, the dependencies, and what you want to do within that. Obviously, AngularJS, their short sure after, um, went to the wayside for Angular and other tooling. So what you can do is you would still sure have this legacy Angular JS, but not everything's dependent on it because you decided to silo it and segregate it to a particular area. So related, I guess, to microservices and not using it, not thinking about kind of distributing your entire environment by service is more so having monolithic boundaries, but using the web queue worker pattern. So basically what we're doing here is we're having our client, our Angular JS or our front end, whatever it ends up being, uh, making a request to our HTTP API. Maybe we interact with our database, we do some change, or maybe it's just fully asynchronous where given, like where it actually makes sense to do it. Or what you're doing is just actually just placing a message on a queue. That way you can immediately return to the client. 
There's a lot of benefits to this, especially in places where the client isn't necessarily expecting a result immediately. So it's not like a query, it's not like you're fetching data, you're saying, hey, I want something to happen. You don't necessarily need to know immediately that it actually is happening. For example, let's say you're sending out emails. So from there, what you can have is a separate process or a separate thread actually uh, handling all the messages that are placed on that queue and it can perform the work whether that's interacting with your database, like I said, sending out an email, it's just offloading a lot of that work from your HTTP API to be processed asynchronously by your worker. So the immediate benefit that you might realize is scale. Whether you have scaling concerns or not, that plays into whether this is beneficial or not, obviously depends on what you're doing. But some of the benefits as well are, do you have like recurring jobs or scheduled jobs, like cron jobs, those types of things. Because oftentimes the tooling that you can be using can also be used there as well. So you can process stuff in the background. It doesn't necessarily need to be kind of queued from the client. It can be happening with something that's recurring. There's just a lot of benefit to queuing, but that comes with a bunch of trade-offs that if you're unfamiliar with it, and I've done a bunch of videos, I'll have some links in the description on handling various scenarios. There's a kind of a lot of will say things that you'll need to overcome and realize isn't just straightforward of, oh, I'm gonna add a queue and everything's great. Now, most are probably familiar with being able to scale out horizontally, kind of that web tier behind a load balancer and you can do that. But if you're using queuing and using queues, you can be doing that with the worker as well. Just adding other instances as you need to. Basically what you're doing is you're processing more messages concurrently using the competing consumers pattern, which I'll have a link in the description about. So just allowing to increase throughput, increase scale, just similarly as you would be to your kind of your web tier, you're scaling it, scaling it out horizontally. Now, an incredibly important note to this with the web queue worker is that the code base for your HP API, your web portion and your worker can be actually the exact same code base. They're really just different entry points into your application. So you may have the same kind of entry point executable for both, or you could create two different executables that your processes are running under, but ultimately they're still built off the exact same code base. Our HTTP API could be using whatever, in my case, it was ASP.NET Core. That's how it's actually kind of getting the input and dealing with output. Our worker, same thing with the message broker or queue system that you're dealing with. That's how it's kind of getting that entry point and using the exact same underlying code base to kind of manage and deal with both of those kind of entry points and those requests. Using the web queue worker pattern in our context was a great decision because it allows us to scale, which we needed. However, a lot of this plays into kind of the context of there's trade-offs here. Giving your context is the web queue worker pattern applicable, depends on how much background work you actually need to do. But one of the big trade-offs here in all of these relates to kind of education, understanding, and there's trade-offs related to implementing something, and there's usually a lot of baggage that comes with it. You're kind of trading one thing for a whole new set of problems. Web queue worker, queues, and what I'm about to uh, next, which also is very beneficial, kind of has a lot of learning curve, which is event-driven architecture. And you're gonna notice a theme here, because everything I'm talking about in the benefits of event-driven architecture for us is about decoupling various aspects of the system so that you can decide how you wanna manage that. So for example, if we have, for example, say a shipment of a package, and let's say that package actually gets delivered. There's a bunch of things that need to happen. One of them for which could have been that we need to email the customer to let them know that their package has been delivered. You've probably experienced this. You probably get an email, hey, your package has been delivered. Behind the scenes, there's a whole whack load of things that also that you might wanna develop or that you need to develop. It could be anything. Maybe you decide all of a sudden, okay, well now we need to send out a text, a text message, an SMS to the customer. Maybe we wanna develop some webhook system so we can push data to some third party integration to let them know when that particular event has occurred. The beauty of this is that they're all independent, not just in code, because they are independent code, but at their execution, if one's failing, it's not affecting the other, and it's not affecting at all when the actual shipment got delivered. So everything, you'll see the thread here when I was talking about kind of the front end, boundaries, all this stuff, it's really about kind of creating boundaries around everything as you, like as best as you can, so that you can let it evolve. If for example, our webhooks, we had some integration and that's no longer applicable, 
we just remove it. It's not tied to anything else. It's not tied to emailing a customer, an SMS, any of that other stuff. That code likely in your system is very compartmentalized and you could just remove it. Or you need to add some new feature to deal with when a shipment is uh, delivered, you add that brand new. It's completely isolated. But the downside to a venture-driven architecture, like many things, is a learning curve if you're unfamiliar with it. Wix.com posted something a while back where I reviewed it, where they kind of mentioned their pitfalls of a venture-driven architecture and kind of their pain points and their kind of how they evolved and started using it. And I illustrated some of the problems that they have they didn't really need to have or common solutions to problems that they were having. So it isn't necessarily trivial, that's for sure. Um, it's again, you are solving problems by creating isolation, but you're creating a whole new set of problems that you have to deal with when you're using EDA. Speaking of events and bad decisions, we were event sourcing part of our application. The event sourcing part was actually a good part, but I want to kind of emphasize kind of a bad decision we made. So event sourcing, I'm going to do this really simply. It's just a way of recording your state given a series of events. So in our case with a shipment, when the vehicle actually arrives at the shipper to pick up the freight, we have that event that when, what time they've arrived. When they actually take that package and put it on the vehicle, that's a loaded event. And then here's the thing I wanna to touch on. When the vehicle is driving down the road, there's different devices that send us information about where a package is. So you can kind of track it where its location is. And then let's say that the vehicle then arrives where at the destination or the delivery where they're supposed to deliver the package. That position one I wanna point out because there would be a lot of these events occur over intervals of time where we get positions and that was very problematic. The reason is because getting that position update, that information about where the actual vehicle is, didn't really have any effect on the other events that we were using to build our state to determine whether the next thing could actually happen. For example, we were gonna limit you. You can't, for example, arrive at the destination if you haven't even arrived or loaded the freight or the package at the pickup. So you're using your state to figure out these invariants, the current state based off the series of events, to whether you can perform the next action. That position had nothing to do with it at all. It was just really clutter in the way. If you think about this in a different way, even if you're not doing event sourcing and think about using a relational database, think about just having a singular table with hundreds of columns. That's kind of the same idea here is that you don't need all those columns given a certain use case. Those positions were very important to us, but they didn't need to be stored in the same event stream. Same thing if you're thinking about a document or a relational database example, is that not everything needs to be in the same big blob, if you will. Same thing when we're going like monolithic here, is trying to compartmentalize things and break things apart so they have better utility. And I really do think that is the key, the essence of good, bad decisions, architectural decisions I made. Good ones are really realizing where you can compartmentalize, decouple things, isolate things into kind of their own unit that allows you to evolve them. And the bad decisions are things that don't allow you to do that. That really kind of is the too long didn't need to watch this at the end. And the more I'm thinking about this as I'm talking out, that really is the key. Kind of defining those small boundaries, let you evolve them. And when you don't define those boundaries, it can become a pain. But of course you can evolve anything. It just might take more work as I've experienced in some of the bad decisions I made and kind of trying to fix those, if you will. They just take some time and a little bit more thought to how to resolve them. This video is actually uh, why you should comment on pretty much everything, was directly related to a post I made and somebody commented saying, hey, I want a deeper look at real life lessons, non-trivial systems, kind of my experience. And that's exactly what this was. It's kind of just thinking about the last 10 years, some, some of the good decisions, bad decisions, and kind of how it all played out. And I think ultimately, everybody kind of goes through this. You live and learn, you kind of try to fix from things. I'd love to hear your comments, get in there, tell me some of the good decisions, bad decisions that you've made, how you've overcome them. I, I just love to hear these stories as other people that commented on this because they wanted to hear from me. So get in the comments and let me know your experience as well. And as well, I have a private Discord server. If you join my channel, you can get access to it. To ask questions like this or just talk about the projects that things you're working on, you can join my channel and get access to that private Discord server. The link's in the description on how to join. If you found this video helpful, please give it a thumbs up. I really appreciate it. If you have any other thoughts or questions or suggestions, make sure to leave a comment and please subscribe for more videos on software architecture and design. Thanks.